Biomedical engineering. It is developing very quickly in the modern world. Something that is inspiring the progress of biomedical engineering is of course electronic engineering. The top graduates from top tier universities are dreaming about how their expertise in electronic engineering can now be implemented in biomedical engineering. Carl Wessels with distinction. He also wins the electronic engineering prize for the best student in electronic engineering and also the electronic engineering prize for the best final year project in electronic engineering. As you've heard, Carl Vessels was the top graduate at the University of Pretoria's Electronic Engineering Department. And now he's moving on to develop and design an in-ear EEG device that might revolutionize industries such as the truck driving industry and the infant care industry and others. Let's find out more. Um, so now you move on to the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineers uh, in Stellenbosch, yeah? Yeah, yeah, correct. So now it's a biomedical division and you guys are designing uh, an in-ear EEG device. Uh, an in-ear EEG, this, this monitors the electrical activity of the brain, right? Correct, yes. So how exactly are you making an in-ear one or does this technology already exist? The thing is the, the first EEG, like EEG in general has been um, around for quite a while. So you can go back to articles, I mean, from like the 1900s of EEG, EEG signals and so on. Um, but it always used to be that thing where you have to like kind of shave your head bald. Then you have to like place electrodes on your head. And then from there, they actually like measure the potential of different places on the skin, on your on your scalp. But um, they actually realized basically the reason I'm, we're using the in-ear EEG is it's because it's a kind of a, a newer area to you place an EEG sensor. And because of its proximity to the brainstem, that's not really um, evident in not a lot of the other EEG, you know, um, areas where you place the electrodes. It actually allows to measure different types of signals better. So it actually will be able to pick up signals between the body and your brain to a much larger degree than the on scalp EEG um, electrodes. I mean, the brain electric, electrical activity is actually, you know, very busy. So if you look at like a three-dimensional pond, right? And an EEG signal would basically be a sensor being placed on the, the edge of that pond, right? Now, if you throw a pebble somewhere in the middle of that pond, it's going to cause a ripple effect of electrical signals in the EEG scenario now throughout the brain and actually reach the, um, el or like the sensor on the outside at some time interval. Now, just imagine that scenario and just having like a million pebbles being thrown into that pond. So the thing is that there's a lot of information electrical signals happening in the brain so the the big thing is trying to kind of focus on different areas or different frequencies or whatever to be able to actually use that data to derive it something usable or something meaningful in the AEG is a new place where they found that you can actually measure signals that might give you a different set of uses where it's actually um, much more useful in different areas because i mean it's it's closer to different parts of the brain and therefore you can actually tap into different electrical signals which will cause you to have different possible um, market uses. In terms of say drowsiness, right? So you see that you, you, you collect the data, okay? And then how do you determine what is drowsiness? In terms of a virtual representation, what does drowsiness look like with an in-ear EEG? Okay, so what we're basically doing is we're measuring like a potential. So that's like a, a voltage on the skin. It's a very small voltage because um, it's just based on you know, the conductivity of the whole brain and the, the, the size of the electrical signals. So it measures a voltage sitting on the skin and that voltage is kind of like a summation of, you know, all the electrical activity happening in that area of the brain. You will actually see that in the low frequency range um, is the most data that's happening inside the brain. So it'll be, I think, something from like zero hertz to um, max 30, 40 hertz that you actually find all of the useful data is lying in, in, the, in that range of frequencies. Something like drowsiness, for instance, if you measure the frequency domain of the signals and you blink your eye, you'll actually see the frequency with which you blink your eye show up as a peak on the frequency domain signal um, due to the fact that your, your eyes actually, as you blink them, it causes them, uh, the muscles to you know, contract and therefore that electrical signal will then show up on the EEG sensor. 
um, and therefore you'll actually be able to see you know the frequency pop up on your EG sensor. So something like that, you can then use it then um, also for different things. So when when a person's eyes are closed, the signal looks different to when the the person's eyes are then again open because there's less information entering into the eye. You can then derive kind of a you know formula based on that and a bunch of other parameters. Maybe you'll measure something like um, just you know the difference um, amplitudes of different you know sets of frequencies within the signal. To kind of you know do machine learning on those um, on those frequencies to then derive at some you know set of algorithms that can determine you know is this person actually awake is he aware of his surroundings is he um, attentive to you know the road um, and basically you know you can kind of build your own set of algorithms around all the data that's available to kind of then determine to a you know a predetermined set of accuracy whether the person is in a jazzy state or whether he is actually awake. Yeah, so you guys say that this would probably be best utilized with guys that do like truck driving, for example, because truck drivers could get drowsy whilst on the job. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the, acceler uh, the accelerometer sensor that you have, this is not gonna pick up the movement of, of the head or anything. It's, it's gonna get its information from the the, the, the in-ear EEG because I mean obviously if it was just an accelerometer for example if I put my head down to my chest would it then go like this guy has fallen asleep how, how do you hook it up with the accelerometer sensor and the in-ear EEG to, to definitely say that somebody uh, has fallen asleep is it, does it always hinge on the data that this thing produces the in-ear EEG yeah so so the main thing is I'm kind of looking at different ways of you know the more sensors you can use the more different types of sensors you can use the I think the the better the degree of accuracy you can actually determine something with. So, what we're actually trying to do is use a correlate or like a correlation between the information we're receiving from the accelerometer, which will give you an indication of you know how much is he moving his head up and down or is he you know looking around as well, which might you know tend to um, end off as a person you know is maybe on the long road or maybe you know um, becoming drowsy. So. What we're trying to do is maybe use a combination of that data along with the EEG signal to kind of determine to a greater degree of accuracy um, whether this person is, you know, kind of in a drowsy state. Uh, app development is quite a nice way of then, you know, giving graphical feedback. Let's just say that the um, fleet manager wants to see exactly the states or the drowsiness state of all of the, the truck drivers on currently on the road. He can then look at maybe an Android app open it up and see you know exactly where every truck driver is and at, in like what state or what drowsiness state the sensor is actually placing them in to give a better indication of you know are they awake are they are they maybe under the influence as well so that's another thing you know like being under the influence of alcohol so we plan to actually you know measure different states of a person and see how it affects brain um, the brain signal to then be able to you know give that feedback maybe over a network to the fleet manager so you can actually either not allow the driver to switch on his car again when he or the truck again where they when they switch it off or to actually you know just monitor um, for insurance purposes for instance so because they actually they might be carrying very expensive loads also valuable to the insurer to you know make sure that the the, the driver wasn't at fault if i can if i can put it that way um, is that going to be an internet of things compliant network is it is it going to just be maybe a 3g network that you guys can set up or what are the network requirements when it comes to sending data straight and in real time from say a driver uh, in a truck to the the fleet manager that's that's elsewhere yeah yeah so i think like because um the the data is probably best off to be sent over like for, for say a, a 4g 3g whatever data network um and because it's kind of the, the infrastructure is kind of already there it'll be easiest to use something like that as a just over the air so i've already started looking in into you know um, internet access through an android application i've written my own um, android application that already accesses the, the internet and pulls information from it and so, so forth so i really started looking at you know transferring something to maybe a server and then be able to also pull that information off the server um, depending on you know are you a driver or a manager in the, in the in the scenario so you'll be able to look at different information depending on you know the the permission that you're allowed um, basically from 
um, your perspective. So obviously a fleet manager will be able to you know access all the drivers, while a driver might only be able to see his own information for that for that example. So the the plan is the the device that can can be ordered the the third party the um, basically uh, processor. Um, it has like a very high resolution ADC on, um, with the ability of also having it also got like a Bluetooth module on. So I'm planning to you know transfer the data from this device to an Android, um, or you know we're starting with Android, but obviously later at a later stage it could also be expanded to other platforms. But Android to start off with, um, send that information to an Android device, and then actually be able to be able to then transfer the data over the air to a server where it could be you know read by um, the fleet manager in, in, in live time. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2014 reported that 1,500 infants died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome. SIDS has been closely linked to SUDEP, Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. This happens before children reach the age of one year old. Coral says that his in-ear EEG device could give parents a fair warning of something that might be wrong with their infant's brain and act as a prevention tool for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. So basically, yeah, Sudden inf Infant Death Syndrome is quite a, you know, a big thing. Actually, the professor that I'm working with at Stellenbosch University is a pediatric surgeon as a, or a pediatric doctor, but anyway, he works with a lot of infants as well. He is quite, you know, big on using this as a potential device that can actually stop or act as a pre-warning system to that. So basically what we plan to do is to use this EEG sensor on infants that might be prone to epileptic attacks, because basically that's also what causes this epileptic attack happening on infants that, you know, because their muscles aren't developed to a certain degree, you don't always realize that they're having a epileptic attack. So if it makes sense that, you know, their brain, the pathways between their brain and their muscles aren't developed to such a degree that you can actually see a physical warning that they are having an um, a epileptic attack and that can cause this sudden infant death. So we are trying to kind of, you know, use the device because an epileptic attack is, you know, attack caused by the brain. It's the brain sending you know, signals to different mus muscles, you know, irregularly or, you know, un unexpected, which actually causes, the, you know, muscles to contract. And um, that's why people, you know, start shaking and the eyes start, you know, moving. During an epileptic attack, you actually see a spike in the EEG signals. So we would use this as a, uh, as a way of monitoring an infant over time and then monitoring for, you know, spikes and, 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 and looking for different things that can indicate towards epileptic attacks so that the infant could, you know, then kind of early enough be, be taken to a hospital where they can be treated. So it's like a 21st century baby monitor. Yeah, it's, it's a baby monitor. And I mean, people might know if there's a genetic kind of vulnerability in their genes to, to having epileptic attacks. And then if they do know that it has been in the, in the family line, then they can obviously use this as a way of then monitoring or possibly use this as a way of monitoring the infant during, you know, sleep or during certain areas where they not always, you know, watching the infant and where the, the infant can't always show, you know, physical indication, you know, by tensing up muscles or whatever of them actually, you know, going through this attack. It, it could, you know, then lead to the, to the life of the infant being saved. They can stop it or attend to it early enough. The in-ear EEG device is part of Carl's two-year master's studies at Stellenbosch University. He says that the first thing to do before this becomes a workable prototype is getting a clear EEG signal through the in-ear EEG device. Once that has been cleared up, this is what Carl plans to do for the future of his in-ear EEG device. Well, what the plan is, is to build a, a working prototype that could be, you know, just optimized in a sense where it's kind of made more market friendly. So what I kind of end off or what I plan to end off with is a device that is working, but a device that can still be, you know, kind of um, manufactured cheaper or manufactured um, to cost less for the consumer. So the plan is to actually also have a device that can be used in areas where, you know, um, expensive medical um kind of expensive medical attention is not always available. So 
you would like to use a device like this maybe in some uh, more rural rural area where it's you know because the plan of the device is not to be expensive the plan is to be a a cheapish de- in in a sense you know relatively cheap device that you can actually take with you that's portable um, and that can be used as kind of not a medical device but a a pre warning device for medical attention. Yeah, you see this you see this in the biomedical industry at the moment, especially you know targeted to the the more rural areas because I mean like smartphone technologies are becoming quite inexpensive at the end of the day it's incredible to see how electronics engineering you know starts at the biomedical and the nanotechnology and how that's going to uh, form part of biomedical engineering at the end of the day I, it, it's it's crazy the stuff that's coming up and i mean like you you're going to be on the forefront of, of doing that so like good luck with the the project i mean uh, you know getting this out there would be the best thing possible because you know, taking care of people while well, allowing, enabling people to take care of themselves to a, to a lesser degree, you know, in terms of, like you say, maybe preventing something that could have been prevented. It's quite interesting how electronics engineering is forming part of that uh, fight, you know, against things that can be prevented before having to go to like a hospital or something. Yeah, and I think uh, it's, especially because we're living in, a, in South Africa, and I think like it's, a, it's still, you know, there are areas that are still very rural and, you know, need to kind of be dealt with and I, I feel if you can make technology that's inexpensive and that you can actually use in areas like big hospitals or very expensive you know equipment hospitals are not always available you can actually you know kind of increase the health care that you can possibly give to areas such like that and I feel you know as a, as a biomedical or a prospective biomedical engineer I feel you know it's very satisfying to know that what you what you are working on can cause social upliftment in a, in, an, in an aspect where you can actually make an impact um, in different areas. So I feel you know that's also a great you know motivating fact, and I feel it's also a really new field. Um, for instance, looking also at like a lot of the nano sensors that are uh, basically being developed these days. You know, like everything that's electronic based and how you're integrating electronics with the body and how they are actually also printing. 3D organs and, 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 and things like that. It's just amazing to see, you know, where the field is going. And I feel, you know, it's it's a great field to be a part of because there's so much still to be developed. And I feel it's, it's a field where there's, you know, it's, it's a very new field and it's, it's got very important applications in the modern day because I feel medicine has kind of always been something that's not electronic in a sense. It's been you know, chemical based and trying to get different, you know, drugs or whatever to to um, interact with different viruses and such. But now you're looking at, you know, electronic devices that can actually measure and even potentially, you know, um, cure someone of a certain disorder. Yeah, totally. But I mean, like this also hinges on the, the, the engineer having a little bit of an entrepreneurial brain. I mean, do you see that more recently in engineering and electronics engineering as a whole that people who go through these things or go through their masters or maybe even go to their doctorates? I mean, you have to have a little bit of a brain for business once you're done with all of this because you want some you want to market something. So do you think marketing skills are probably a good thing for engineers to have? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And I've kind of seen it with, uh, with engineers that I've known or old engineers that I've known is that you tend to fall into two categories. Either you, you know, just end up working for, for someone for the rest of your life. I mean, you'll, you'll earn a decent salary, but you'll never, you know, kind of end up at a, at a top class, if I can put it that way. So you'll end up, you know, always designing something for someone else. Or, you know, as soon as you have that business aspect with a background of also knowing the technology, I think it immediately takes you to a, a very, you know, small group of people in, in today's age that can you know actually run engineering projects and I, I, I feel in the end of the day you're going to be working in an environment where you have a couple of engineers working together so if you have management skills if you have marketing skills to a greater ability you'll be able to you know take the product to a to a place where it can actually you know bring in a, a solid income 